I, this way, if I was a, if I was a um, mentor, a young person that wanted to get into the fitness industry, eventually wanted to open up their own gym, my take would not be like, okay, you graduate college, go get your level one, become a trainer. I would um, become a member at a um, gym that you really, really admire mm -hmm. and respect. Um, I think there's so much to be gained from that, not only in terms of best practices, but what would you, what could you do for better practices? Mm -hmm. It's like if you, I, I think you have to have you eaten out at some restaurants before you open up a restaurant. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Hello, Ben. Hey, Patrick. How are you? Great. Good. Today we're going to talk about uh, building uh, or navigating a new career or a new business within fitness or within the the world of fitness. Cool. Right? Yep. And um, I think we'll stick to uh, the world of sort. You know, you have your hands in a few different things within the world of fitness in the broader sense. Um, but I think we'll probably try to keep it to uh, training people and gyms and and that world. Yeah. Um, unless you see something applicable to to talk about, um, you know, things like comp train or whatever else. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to start with just a sense from you on what, uh, just a reminder of what your life was like, uh, when you started on this journey. Um, we've definitely talked about it, uh, a bit in the past, but I'm curious if you want to just walk us back a little bit, just so we have a good context for, um, what was your life like when you decided to, make uh, training, fitness, CrossFit, sort of the thing that you decided to do? When I was going through school, I never had the ambition of um, becoming a trainer, becoming a gym owner or coach or anything of the like. Um, my fit, uh, my future laid in the path that my dad um, had um, kind of followed, which was um, the, the traditional business world, the nine to five corporate America. So when I went, when I graduated school, I went into that. I became, a, I worked for finance um, for State Street Bank in Boston, um, kind of pushing money around the world, doing back office work for um, foreign exchange traders. <clears throat> and then um, as a lot of people know, I've listened to this, when 9-11 happened, I had this like epiphany, this um, revelation, which this is not what I, I, I didn't like it from the get-go, but I had no impetus to, for change. When that happened, it was it, that was the impetus. It was enough that like I want to like I I don't want to be behind a cubicle, you know, behind a computer, um, in a cubicle, um, you know, for the rest of my life. This is just not what I'm meant to be. So, um, I I I took a year off, became a ski bum, kind of get my life in order, and I um, that's where I kind of found um, where I fell back on my passion of fitness. I was doing triathlons at the time. I always went to the gym. Um, I always read like Men's Health. Like I was the guy that like knew about like glycemic load before anybody, like any of my friends even mm -hmm. knew like what, sh that sugar was bad for them. Um, so I, I was like, kind of like, okay, I kind of have a, I have a little bit of a head start in this. It's of all the things out there, it's a thing that I, I know how to make money. I mean, it makes sense. Like if I was becoming a, a songwriter, I have no idea like, <laughs> like how do I make money out of that, yeah. right? Um, so I, I got it. I understood like from point A to point B how to do this. So I started training people in homes. Um, in in their homes, <laughs> just uh, in random homes. Yeah, you're right. Um, th that house looks empty. <laughs> and then uh, and then from there, kind of like share the track so people can understand my journey a little bit. Um, I started working at a global gym for people I know is a Boston sports clubs, and there's like New York sports clubs, and that's part of that chain. Um, and I was a personal trainer there for about a year and a half or so. And then I started to find um, CrossFit and became a strength and conditioning coach at a uh, one of like the elite New England prep schools. Um, and that's when I really started to, I became affiliated, got my level one, started training some of the parents, um, rented out space from the school to train them while the kids were in school. Then grew that to where I rented out space from another um, community center. And that snowballed after about two, three years to where I was like, the writing was on the wall. Like I had a nice cool client base of about 50 people taking my morning classes consistently, um, you know, not showing up every day, but like that was my customer base, if you mm -hmm. want to say, somewhere between that 40 and 60 number um, that I, I signed a lease at the building we're in now. Um, and then um, like everybody had growing pains, start off with a, a membership of about, you know, I, I retained about of those 40, retained about, 
you know, I, about 30 members on day one when I started. Um, worked really hard, long hours, you know, from sun up to sundown, the normal journey of an entrepreneur. You know, it was the grind. I didn't take a, a vacation for two years, worked six days a week. We closed the gym on Sundays because otherwise I wouldn't have a day off. I worked mm. every day. Um, so seven days a week from, you know, about 14, 16 hour days every day, not to including like the, the time where you go home and then you're on your emails and everything else. But it was awesome. It was like really, really, really awesome because for the first time in my life, um, I was doing something I was passionate about. I loved, I, I, enj I didn't realize how much I liked to work because I, mm. um, I didn't, I was never doing something I loved. So I used to hate work. I used right. to live for five o'clock and used to live for Friday nights and um, you know, the two weeks vacation. Um, and that, was, that just changed the ball game for me. Um, what was the what was the change that happened from um, being a personal trainer at, at Boston Sports Club to being a strength and conditioning coach at a um, at a, an elite private school or however you put it? Uh, like what I, was the one? How long did that take from? I, I have clients who I train at this global gym and then suddenly you're at the the school. Like, yeah, I was doing I was doing the global thing for probably a year and a half or maybe two years. And memory isn't served me that well there. Um but the it was, you know, call it luck if you want to, but it's like I think luck is where like opportunity meets preparedness, right? I was ready for that position. You know, I was um I had I had done enough um um I don't work in the field that I knew kind of felt like I, I had a program set. So when I went for the interview, I said, this is how we're going to work. This is how it's going to be different than, and of course I was like, we're working with sandbags and kettlebells, mm -hmm. which they're like, what about the leg extension machine that mm -hmm. we have? And like, <laughs> literally I went in, I went into the, 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 um, the high school gym and like day one before I started, literally like I went in there, the gym, it's closed, I have the keys. I went in there, I moved all of the equipment out in the hallway. <laughs> and the athletic director comes in, he's like, what the hell are you doing? And I had like, uh, you know, looking back on it, I was like, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> but that's why I, I literally, I was like, we need floor space. We're like, yeah. you can't do this with this. And he's like, it's not just the students, it's the teachers, the teachers use equipment. I was like, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I went in with this vision of what we were going to do. Yeah. Um, probably didn't clarify it enough or ask for permission enough, but I went and I changed the the approach and I had a very clear idea of the way I wanted to do things. Um, started doing it and uh, did it for two years before like uh, enough momentum built up where I was like, this is something I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Were you successful uh, off the bat from in, in the school in terms of like, were you able to see what was in your head? Were you able to see it in action? Uh, no, I mean, truth be told, I had a I had a um, a methodology, a philosophy, but I didn't have a big grand vision. Um, I wish I, you know, going, if I had to go back now, I would have changed things. I would have done things a little bit differently. Um, kind of like for people that want to geek out about it, I training a team, um, I went a little a bit- A sports team? A sports team. So I would train like uh, the football team. And I would train, I would work with like, you know, the tennis team or whatever it was, the wrestling team. Um, and because you only get to work with those guys like once, twice, maybe at most, like you're working with them three times a week, but really it's usually in the off season for the football team. It was in season. I got them once a week in the weight room and then once a week on the field. Um, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have dived so far down the rabbit hole of constant variance. I would have gone with more of a, uh, um, set system periodized approach because, um, constant variance works really well when you have a lot of frequency, a lot of consistency, a lot of work yeah. behind it. It doesn't work well when you get it once a week. Mm -hmm. So if once a week you're doing snatches, but then the next week you do um, back squats, and the next week you do rowing and burpees, it's like you don't get that. It's going to take a long, long, long time. Uh, you know, trajectory towards that that horizon of gains. Right. I would have gone a little bit differently. Like, let's um, let's just get really strong. Let's do a yep. back squat cycle, or let's get. I would have um, blended the world of CrossFit with traditional strength conditioning a little bit more than I did. When you started, uh, when you made that transition, you said, "Okay, this is the direction I want to go." <clears throat> did you have any credentials, and was that important? Um, yeah, I had my CSCS. You know, if that's um, if that's yeah, I had like a. I had my ISS, you know, I had, yeah, I had a lot of these like training certifications. So mm -hmm. I had my um, my NASM certification, my NSCA, I mean, I hope we're getting the right, uh, CSCS, I had ISSA, International Sports and Science, you know, I had, um, so I guess to the people hiring me, it mattered. But in terms of 
anything else, it, uh, those things don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Those are like, I don't know, I just think they mean nothing. Right. You know, I think that practical application and time in the gym is so much more important. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, you know, to the point where if somebody's applying for a position with me now and they have their CSCS, um, I, that doesn't mean give them any more credibility or any more credence than somebody that does not. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas in the world of fitness, that's seen as the highest level of certification. Um, if somebody had their CrossFit level four, that would turn my head. Mm -hmm. That's something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's um, let's let's turn a little bit to maybe a version of you if you were twenty five or twenty six today. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's roughly how old you were when this journey yep. started. Yeah, maybe. Yep. Where um, does that same trajectory, would that same trajectory hold today as it did 10 or 15 years ago? In other words, if you were to just, if you alternate universe, you would just, yep. it, it just started again today. Would you be able to go through what you went through and would it yield some version of what's, what it, it did yield now or yielded for you? Um, or or yeah. what's, what's different about now that wasn't? Okay, so I would if I was to go through it now, I mean, I loved my journey because I got to see kind of like all sides of it, right? I I, I got into fitness. Um, so I played rugby and did like traditional bodybuilding. Not that I ever got on stage or anything like that, but that's the way I trained. That's yep. the way everybody trained, right? Yep. You go to the gym and do back and buys, you know? Um, so, um, you know, I came to this like world of like sport. So I played rugby in college. Um, and, um, this bodybuilding training in the mm -hmm. gym, then I kind of morphed that into triathlon, um, in the years outside of college. And then I did globo gym personal training. So that kind of gave me this nice kind of, you know, in the traditional, like, uh, personal training route, this kind of a nice background, this foundation that I had before I got into CrossFit, mm -hmm. which I think, um, um, suited me well. You know, I understood like um, Russian periodized approach to um, training as well as like what a um, traditional um, a taper program for a marathon would look like. So I kind of speak to a lot of different camps. Yep. Um, I think that if I was to go through the process now, that lended well to what I was trying to create, but um, the there's different opportunities now, like totally different opportunities. CrossFit didn't even exist when I started. So right. I shouldn't say that. It was like, it wasn't available to me. Um, now, if I was to go through the process, I think I would bypass the global gym model and um, I would become a member. I, this way, if I was a, if I was a um, mentor, a young person that wanted to get into the fitness industry, eventually wanted to open up their own gym. My take would not be like, okay, you graduate college, go get your level one, become a trainer. I would um, become a member at a um, gym that you really, really admire mm -hmm. and respect. Um, I think there's so much to be gained from that, not only in terms of best practices, but what would you, what could you do for better practices? Mm -hmm. It's like if you, I, I think you have to have you eaten out at some restaurants before you open up a restaurant. Right. Like, don't just be like, I eat food, I should open a restaurant. Like go and experience what it means to be a customer at some restaurants. That way you decipher like, I really like this. Um, I think we can move this needle better in this direction and so on. Um, that would be my first suggestion is definitely become a member and um, definitely for a, uh, a year. Now, if you can do that while also potentially like maybe interning there, that would be phenomenal. You know, if I, w I think the way to do this would be like, um, can I work the front desk for you for minimum wage, you know? And um, for that, can I hang around your coaches' meetings and see how you develop your coaches and shadow some classes and talk to your coaches? Go and offer that, but don't go there without the offer of like, here's how I can help you. Mm -hmm. Mentorship, um, when you think about it, should be a, most people look at it like, how can this person help me? I need a mentor that can help me. And um, it has to be a two-way street and really it should be the other way. It should be like, if you're going to go to somebody and say like, um, like I've had people come up to me and say like, will you mentor me? And like, I don't have the bandwidth to do that. But if they come up to me and like, um, I'd love to gain some knowledge off of you. Would you mind if I um, kind of sat in around your meetings and around your classes, just a fly on the wall, just so I could absorb some things. And by the way, I'd love to help you out with your facilities or, you know, um, the equipment or... Um, some marketing stuff or whatever you have a skill set in, or mm -hmm. I could do some data analytics for you, or I could, um, whatever it is, like help them out. That way it becomes like exciting for someone like, yeah, that sounds like 
let's see what if we can make that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Do you um, what advice would you give to other coaches in your position if if they were to hear from somebody and um, you know whether or not they explicitly said you know I'm looking for a mentor, can you help me? How how do you how you know just to flip it a little bit? How do you make uh, that experience useful for them as well. For the mentee? For, for the mentee, yeah. Yep. Like, how do you make sure that um, they're not just getting coffee and then you ignore them? Okay, so first off, I think it's on the responsibility of the mentee yep. to make it useful. Like, literally, you're giving them access. Mm -hmm. So from there, it's on them to like glean as much. So would that be like, um, okay, so I got an internship with Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. How is he gonna make this good for me? It's mm -hmm. like, that's not how it works. He's pulling, he's opening the door for you. You're allowed access inside his world. Now it's up to you. It's up to me as the person that's working for Bill yep. Belichick to gain as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's. Um, I don't think it's the responsibility of the mentor. Now, having said that, if there's nothing that you have that you're willing to share, if there's nothing that you're willing to um, expose that person to, um, if there's nothing that you can use their help with, then it's not a good relationship. It's not mm -hmm. the way to do that. You're not... Either it's a mentorship process uh, um, program or a internship um, is not the right fit for you right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's It has to be um, a little bit of a two-way street, right. but really the onus and responsibility falls on the mentee to gain to pull as much as they can out of it. Okay, so uh, let's assume that they've done that for six months, eight months, nine months, maybe a year. What Throughout that year, um, should they be looking to, you know, whether it's going to their CrossFit level one, whether it, like, what is, yep. whether it's, it, should they be looking for individuals who they can train? Like where, what, wh how do they get the most out of that year? Assuming that they're doing enough to be able to, you know, stay in the room and be in, you know, be at the meetings or whatever it else, you know, and help the way they can, what should they be looking at in order to get that, the kind of experience or knowledge or, or whatever? Um, so I would love to be able to say, do your level one and do your kid certification and take USAW and take Coach B's seminar and make sure you go to see Chris Hinshaw. And um, the truth is, anything you do is going to benefit you. Yep. Um, it's more of a mindset. What you need to be able to do, what you should be doing is as you're absorbing information is not saying like, um, okay, I knew that or, ooh, this is new information. What you be saying, what you all, whenever you're hearing something, whether it's a podcast or reading a book or at a certification or taking a course, the thought process should always be, how am I going to re-disseminate this information? Mm -hmm. yeah, how, I'm absorbing this so that I now have the, the wherewithal to pass this along to somebody else. So if you're at a seminar and someone said something what, like that, that kind of catches your eye or even something really fundamental and basically that you know already, what you should be saying to yourself is like, can I represent that? Can mm -hmm. I say that back to someone else? And that's when you're becoming a coach. Mm -hmm. Until you can own the material and give back to you, well, now you're just it, you're just the black box that next thing comes out of. It's all inputs. It sits in there. You're becoming really, really knowledgeable, but it's not coming back out. Welcome to academia. That's right. basically what that is. Like, right. let's just learn for the sake of learning. What we need to do as coaches is learn, reformulate that inside the black box, figure out how we're going to reposition it, reword it, and to own it ourselves. And what's the way we can redisseminate that in our words to make that even more, like develop it into where it's even more um, digestible, more mm -hmm. clear, more relatable. I'm going to make this information even better. So I hear something that Simon Sinek says, okay, how do I relate that to coaching world? Like, mm -hmm. okay, he talks to, you know, Google and Apple and the millennials and all that. Like, how do I reposition that to I'm talking to games athletes? How do I reposition that to talk to somebody that needs to get off diabetes medication? This is valuable information for anybody to hear. I can't just spit it back out. Well, if you can spit it back out, that's step one, right? right? And what most people do is it comes in and it gets lost in the bookshelves inside their mind and it never comes back out. Like always be thinking, how can I create this as my own message? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'll like... Honestly, that's when I read a book. Like I can remember, um, like I talk about this a lot, but the first kind of like three books I read when I was starting my business was um, Seven Habits with Covey, um, E-Myth, but Gerber, and um, um, Win Friends and Influence People, Car uh, Dale Carnegie. And I was, I was reading those things. It was like, this is not just for my information. 
how am I gonna talk to my employees about this stuff? Mm -hmm. How am I gonna talk to my athletes about this stuff? And when you, if I read something and I couldn't close the book and say it, I'd reread the paragraph. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to own the information, not getting through it. So you ask like what certifications to take, it doesn't matter as long as you're going through them not to check the boxes. Mm -hmm. That's why I say don't, I'm not gonna give a suggestion because then people think it's like, take this one, check the box, take this one, check the box. It's not that at all. Take any of them, take things way outside the space. Go get USA Triathlon certified. Like that'd be phenomenal, you'd learn a ton if you're trying to figure out how to repurpose the information for yourself. Mm, love that. Um, where, or, or talk to me about the period where you could have been I've got, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm in this school. I've got these, these sort of clients. When did it become, I want to build a business? Cause that, that's a whole other ball game, right? Yeah. That's you're talking about, like you did, uh, you're talking about facilities, which means yeah. equipment, which means X, Y, Z, right. it means employees eventually. What made you say that's the direction I want to go versus I'm really, I'm really comfortable here. You know, I'm, I'm at the school. I'm doing a good job. I've got these. I think you call yeah. it Ben's boot camp. Yeah, like right. you could have done. You could still be doing that yep. theoretically. Where my first email address was Ben at Ben's Ben's Fit Camp. I'm pretty sure I sent you an email to that. Yeah. at some point. Um, There's actually actually a blog still out there called Ben's Fit Camp. So <laughs> if you look it up, it's like I think it's called Ben's Fit Camp. Dot com, I think okay. it's alive somewhere. <laughs> so it's one of our members brought it up to me. Like that's a, really funny. A three weeks ago or so. So what? Where did it? Where did it become a business and not a um, whatever else that is? Where, where did you become a business person and yeah. not a trainer? So I, I think ah, uh, so um, it's so shades of gray. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when you're a trainer, you're creating a business. Yep. If you don't make business, you don't get paid. Mm -hmm. So I'm not like when I was working for the um, Globo Gym. It's not a salary position. If you don't train people, you don't get paid. So um, so you're constantly building business. So that's why it was shades of gray. It wasn't like flip the switch from like salary to my own business. Yep. It was kind of just like continually morphing and changing. So as I started to move out of the global gym world where there's 6,000 potential clients walking by your face every day, that's when it changes a little bit when you go, okay, I'm no longer gonna be there. I'm gonna be at this other facility in a school with nobody walking by. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes Ben's foot camp and it's I'm responsible. I was responsible for before, but now I'm more like responsible for actually like pulling him in somehow. And that's um that was the that was the first shade of gray to building my business. And then from there, it was um probably even a bigger leap to um, okay, I'm leaving this to where I rent the space by the hour. I pay the school, I pay the community center for an hour rental to be able to use the space to, I'm signing a lease giving first, last and security. You know, if this doesn't work, um, I'm, I'm putting in, you know, tens of thousands of dollars into equipment and all the rest. Um, if this doesn't work, this is a much bigger risk. So that's really where the difference was, um, not in terms of a shift in terms of like, I'm secure, this is a business. It was just taking the leaps of bigger risk and responsibility uh, along the way. And just to put a timeline to it, um, kind of mentioned it, but it was like about a year and a half, um, maybe two years at the global gym, and then a year and a half, almost two years at the school. Mm -hmm. And that's where it became, um, kind of the writing was on the wall, like this is something I should do. Now, when it became this is something I should do, it didn't make it like, it was not like so super clear. There was a lot of um, second guessing, mm -hmm. a lot of what if this doesn't work, a lot of um, fear, a lot of um, being scared and, you know, there was tears for sure and un uneasiness and, um, but um, never for once was I like uh, questioning if it was the right decision. Mm -hmm. Like it's still like, even if it was like in a fail, it was still like, this is something I should try. I felt so passionate about it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, the thing I think is <laughs> the risk was like the guy that gave me the lease. Like here's mm -hmm. this like yeah. 20, you know, something like 20 something year old kid, like 28, 29 year old kid um, that's never run a business before outside of like this thing I did part-time and had 40 clients. And he's like, okay, <laughs> sign on the line for a five-year lease or yeah. three-year lease, whatever it was. Um, you know, that's that's a bigger risk almost than, than what I was doing. Yeah, that's funny. Um, okay, so let's go back to the the the, the individual who's just mentored and work, you know, done what they could do, you know, inside of a, an affiliate or a gym that they they sort of respected and want to learn from. 
Um, what does the next few steps look for look like for them? And could they could they could it look similar to for them what it looked like for you in that they you know they uh, they found twenty clients to do a boot camp esque yep. thing, or they found you know a corner in a community center yep. that they could rent out by the hour. Is that even is that still possible in your in your mind, or is there, a good question. Or, or is it different now? And does it, that we know it's different, so it's definitely different. That doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, I think it's uh, it's not as easy to do the organic growth route that I did because um, back when I did it, it was either you're doing personal training in home or you're going to um, some sort of group training thing, usually at a Globo gym and doing some sort of like boot campy type thing slash aerobics. Um, and there really wasn't an option for, um, I, I, I'm, the words are going through my mind is like real fitness mm -hmm. or like more, uh, back then it was considered more like hardcore. Right. Like um, we were in a basement and we would do like thrusters with barbells. It was like, and we do like um, rings and we do like kettlebells and it was like, play with medicine balls. Like that was, is a really kind of like an underground obscure thing, which made it, uh, there was a talk trigger to it, mm -hmm. right? When marketing jargon, it was like, it gave people something to talk about, which I don't think people would have now if they did it because it's commonplace. Mm -hmm. Having barbells and kettlebells and thrusters and these high intensity workouts, there people are doing it all over the place. So you opening up in the community center, it's like, I don't think it'd be as easy. Yeah. Um, which means, you take a, a little bit of a different route, which um, would be, you know, either you just kind of build up a following inside of the gym that you are, you're at and you build up um, some street cred in terms of your ability as a trainer and then you go open up and whether you pull people away from that gym or not, um, when you open up, people are like, if you open up, like, let's say you even open up, um, you know, 50 miles away, at least people would be like, you know, you got to go see you know, right. Matt, he right. is so good. Like he's, he worked at XYZ CrossFit, you know, that type of thing. Yep. Um, building up the street cred matters a lot. So um, I think it's a lot easier to do that um, from whatever. I did it through um, obscure underground boot camp. Yep. <laughs> but if you were to do it now, um, training in a traditional CrossFit gym, um, that's a great way to do it. Um, you know, but I do still think that you don't need to, pull on investors. I don't think that you need to get partners. I don't think that you need to go really big. The way I would do it is um, find a way to do it with the lowest barrier to entry possible, lower the risk. Our, our business model lends to it so well. You don't need to do the global route, which is the global gym model is huge barrier to entry, huge investment, like upwards of like three to $30 million, right? Mm -hmm. Let's call it the low end of it. Like to get a facility, to outfit it, to put in the smoothie bar, to put in all the ellipticals, to put in all the machines, to put in all the mirrors, to put in all the locker rooms. You're talking at minimum $3 million, yep. like minimum. Now, if you want to scale it up, we can go up to 30. Or you're in the middle of a city or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So from, from there, um, what they do is they race to the bottom. Who can charge the least and get the most members? So let's try to get 6,000 members and charge them 10 bucks a month. That's the business model. Well, ours is the opposite. Like, let's open up where there's low traffic, like in an industrial park, and let's not get the really big, pretty uh, storefront in a retail area. Let's get a warehouse. Let's get tons of floor space, no equipment, and then when very low startup costs, yep. should be like definitely, if, depending on what, for this model we're talking about with a low, um, open up for under 30 grand. Right, Total all in, all in. Doors open. Buy a few, row, like three or four rowers, buy three or four sets of barbells. Get a small rig. Get some wall balls. You know, skip the dumbbells. Skip the plyo boxes. Skip the, you know, um, the true form runners. Skip the skier. Like, like, what are the bare essentials to run classes with six people? Like mm -hmm. that type of thing. Yep. Um, from there, get a few clients, and you can pay your rent by having you know 25, 30 clients. And then from there, grow it organically. And as you get more income, you don't put it towards your IRA. You don't go to fancy dinners. You don't get a nicer apartment or a nicer car. Every dollar you spend goes into buying the next rower, to buying some boxes, to buying the next set of barbells, to getting a bigger rig, to getting a bigger space. 
it lends so well because our model is high tuition, low rent. We can charge $150 to $250 a month and we only pay warehouse rents. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're paying, you know, depending on where you are, you're paying like, you know, five to 15 bucks a square foot. You know, if you're in the city, I get it. It's double that, maybe triple yeah. if you're in New York City. But that still pales in comparison to, you know, if you were to go retail front where we are. So if we're paying in the neighborhood of, you know, in the, the 10 to 15 bucks a square foot, we go high busy retail storefront and you're double that. Mm-hmm. 100%. Like, it makes no sense. You don't need to be there. Right. Um, One thing that I'm, um, I've, I've thought a lot or I think about a lot is... Uh, how does an individual know uh, if they're the type of person who should open a gym or if they're the type of person who should help somebody else grow their gym? It's really interesting that you think about that a lot and you haven't opened a gym. No. That's good that you think about that a lot. <laughs> um, I don't think a lot of people think about that enough before they start. Yeah. Um, I'm not to say that, like, that people that open gyms shouldn't at right. all. I just think that you should ask yourself that question a lot. Um, the example I'll give there is back when um, um, I was in my college years and I was um, in the summer, I, I worked for a sailing program. I was a sailing coach and I thrived in the um, like the head coach position, not at running the program. Mm-hmm. I didn't have, that wasn't what I was interested in. It wasn't what I was passionate about. Um, you know, I've changed since then. I love running an organization, but I think it's a that having that introspective look and ask of yourself is, do I um, love the business of running a gym or do I love working with athletes? Mm-hmm. It's a huge difference. And um, I, one is not better than the other. You can have a really fulfilling career and life working with athletes, like phenomenally so. Like if like you could make um, you know six figures training athletes for sure. Um, do it on a one-on-one basis, charge a hundred bucks an hour, do the math, and you can really make six figures um, working not 40 hours a week. Mm-hmm. You And you have very little risk, yeah. very little stress, very little extra work to do. There's no, like, as opposed to what, you know, you can also make equally as nice of a living and the potential is a little bit higher um, in terms of earning potential, not necessarily in lifestyle, it depends on what you're looking for by being a gym owner, but it's a different ball game. Like I, you know, take away like what I do with the games athletes, my elite athletes, I coach one class a day now. So if that's my passion, that's my drive, that's where I get my fulfillment. I don't have the bandwidth to do more than that anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, if to, it's a great question to ask yourself. And I, um, I don't have the right questions or the right answers to figure out what it is to figure out who you are right. other than, that's a really good question that you should be asking yourself. Okay, so we've got somebody who's who's found a good space that's not too expensive. They're able to get 20 or 30, you know, they're, they're able to, to work hard and get yeah, 20. Yeah, so or- other way to kind of like to jump in there. Yeah. If you don't know how to get the first 20 members, don't open up yet. Good. That's a good really rule. like, people yeah. are like, I'm like, you know, because my method is always like kick ass with one client. Yep. Get that one client and just blow them out of the water. Like just make them amazing. Like just like everything you have. Uh, my first client was Brian Curley. He's yep. still a member of our gym, yep. you know. Um, but I tried working with him about 16 years ago. Um, been a member of our gym for 10 years. Uh, he won the first Masters CrossFit Games. He's, you know, he's still PRing at 59 years old. Um, you know, I got him when he was, you know, 41, I think, or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and just from there, it's like go, go, go. And people are like, well, how do you, how do you get the first one? And the answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> but get the first one. Yeah. I got it through like a friend of my mom's. Like his wife was a friend of my mom's. I had never met that. And she got him a uh, Ben Bergeron personal training gift certificate for his 41st Did you birthday. Did you invent that? Yes. <laughs> gift certificate? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes, I could do yes. that. Yes, of course I give you a gift certificate. <laughs> How do I? Okay. Do I do Copy that? and paste yeah. some like stock art of a guy on a BOSU ball. You know? <laughs> like, awesome. Okay. So uh, that's a fantastic point. And I actually remember... Uh, one of the seminars that you did maybe a year and a half, two two years ago, maybe now, somebody had just opened a gym and they had asked you sort of like basically that question. And and your answer was, I would have told you not to open the gym because they didn't yeah. have the the 20 or 30. You know, they didn't have that base. They you just got to build up they, the they base. They had the passion, but they didn't have the 
the the clientele yet. Like imagine like opening up a restaurant and being like, I don't know if anyone's gonna show up on day one. Right. Like you gotta know people are gonna show up on yeah. day one. You're putting too much in. The, the, like said another way, you should never. So the question came up. I did a seminar this past weekend, um, and the question came up about um, going into debt or like uh, when should you break even? When should yeah. be profitable? Day one. Like if you can't be profitable on day one, um, you shouldn't be like you should not not paying yourself, but you can pay the the rent, you can buy the equipment, you can pay for the water bill and the electric um, based off the current um, clientele you have right now. If you don't have that, spend some extra time building a personal brand. Right. Like that's where you should be doing. Like invest in the personal brand until when you open up, you know you have the X number of clients. I don't, if you're in New York City, it's gonna be more than 20, right? Right, <laughs> right. okay, so um, excellent point. Let's assume that we're there and they have that, in, they have that client base and they're open. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of things that uh, you've learned over the last ten years of CrossFit New England um, that if you had known ten years ago, it would have been a lot a lot easier. Is not the right word, but uh, yeah. but you would have moved a lot quicker. What are one or two really big things that when that individual is in that position, they've got the doors open, they've got some people in, and they're really ready to 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 you know hunker down and make this the next five, 10, 15 years of their life. What are the important things that they if if they know if they know and understand it on day one, they would it'll make everything better. Okay, I'm gonna give the um the generic answer that any business person would give because it's the right answer. Yep. Um and then I'll give a little something more specific, which is always be thinking how can I make this better for the customer? Not better for you. It's not like, how can I increase the profit margins? It's not how can I create more free time for myself? It's not how can I scale this? You know, how can I get from 100 to 300 members? That's not the question you're asking. Literally every single day you walk in the door, ask yourself, how can I make this better for my customers? Mm -hmm. That's by far and away, if you see things from your customer's point of view, you know, that's the secret, you know, that's one of Henry Ford's. The secret to success lies in being able to see your business from your customer's point of view as well as from your own. That'd be number one. Yep. Number two, not as jargony, um, would be know what you're trying to create. Like who, who is your target market? Mm -hmm. And now when I first, you know, I, I did the business model stuff and I wrote a business plan and I found out about target markets. And when I first opened up, I was like, well, skip that section because <laughs> anybody that wants to yeah. come into my gym i want them as a member like yeah. little i don't I, they're like because they were like find out the socioeconomics figure out the uh, the um the radius in terms of geographic region check out the you know in terms of um the demographics of their age and their you know the median income and i was like it doesn't matter to me at all like if they want to be here i want them as a customer and i was wrong about that like mm -hmm. i figure out who is your customer it's not just you know, anybody that wants to come in and get fit. Back in the day for us, we did CrossFit, which is a certain methodology to it, mm -hmm. right? And a certain like mindset of people. So literally spend some time defining what that mindset is. And you know it, you just haven't put it down on paper. It's people that are willing to work for results. They're not looking for shortcuts, right? It's people that are humble enough to accept feedback. It's um, people that like to be a part of a community. So once you define that, it, it sets you up to answer some questions. Somebody walks in your door one day and they're like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a space to do some Olympic lifting. I know you have bumper plates. Can I just come in on the side and do some lifting on the side? Mm -hmm. Well, if you know that your target market is somebody that wants to be a part of a community, the answer that's no. Right. Right. And now you have, you know what you're looking for. If you don't have that clarified, then you're like, yeah, you know what we'll do? We'll create like this little prorated membership for you. And you know, because you haven't defined who it is you're looking for. When someone comes in and they're like, hey, I just really want to get fit, really fit in six weeks. Can you help me do that? They says, no. Mm -hmm. Like we, we don't take the shortcuts. We, this is a, this is a long, um, haul. This is hard work. You got to be able to put in the work. Someone comes in and you give them feedback and they're like, not accepting it well and they're like yeah. dude i just want to like i don't want i don't want to be coached here right. i just want to like i just want to work out it's like well that's not the right fit now you, you're figuring out you're defining your community mm -hmm. and you're starting to create a community similar to that what we knew early on which i didn't define well enough but i put it in terms of like um what are our, some of our goals is we were competitive we were really competitive and i wanted to create a competitive gym i wanted the highest participation in the open i wanted to win the crossfit games i wanted individuals at the crossfit games every year i wanted people on the podium at the um crossfit games 
that set up the trajectory of what we were trying to create. And we followed that pretty well. We've switched gears drastically in the last three years, but knowing what we're trying to create now is very different. Now we're trying to create a family of humble, hungry, happy people who kick ass in their 90s. We want a group of people that get along really well, a family. We want people of those family to have certain character traits, that they're humble, hungry, and happy. And we want them to be fit, but not like three minute friends and games and regionals and you know sub three hour marathons. We're looking for them to kick ass in their 90s. And once you create that, and you know what you're looking for, well, if people start complaining and you're not able to change them, like, dude, you're not happy. Like, mm -hmm. this might not be the place for you. Right. And it just, that little thing of knowing who you are sets you up for so many, um, it brings so much clarity to what you're trying to create. I, I would start with that and mm -hmm. try to figure out, um, from there, it's kind of another way of saying like, what's your core values, what's your mission, but it's just a different way. Like yep. button up, what is your brand? Yes, you're CrossFit. Yes, you're um, you're trying to get people fit, but it's more than just that. There's something special to you. Do you work with obese people? Do you work with kids? Do you work with the inner city um, population? Do you work with elite athletes? Are you trying to get people to, the, um, to be studs at the NFL combine? Are you trying to um, create a family atmosphere? It's like create the niche inside the niche. Yeah. And the thing that that allows you to do is not only un understand what decisions are the right decisions or the wrong decisions, <clears throat> but it also allows you to talk about what you do in such a way that it attracts more of the right people okay. so that they continue to come in your door. And so that you're not getting people who are looking for three minute abs yep. because you've already expressed all the things that you, you know, the things that you believe and the things that you're trying to accomplish. I really believe um, like the clarity of vision um, is one of the, so in the beginning years, um, I had a vision, it's changed over the, so here's how I started off. I was, um, when I was doing those, renting the space from the um, school and the community center, this was my big um, revelation. This is my big aha epiphany moment was we were getting people fit and doing really cool workouts. We were doing Barbara, we were doing Murph, we were doing Fran, we were doing heavy you know, deadlifts with barbells. We were doing constantly varied function movements at relative high intensity. But I can remember this moment, and it's, I can remember like it was yesterday. I know where I was sitting in the gym. I remember where the boom box was. I remember like everything. And I remember sitting there about three minutes after the class ended, and I was the only one in the gym. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just thinking to myself like, we're getting people fit. But this isn't th this isn't it. This mm -hmm. isn't what I want. And right then I was like, because I was the only one in the gym three minutes afterwards, I was like, I think the way I should be measuring the success of um, what I'm trying to create by how many people are still here hanging out 20 minutes after class. If I have three people, I'm gonna give myself a score of three for that day. Mm -hmm. And if I have 10 people, that's a 10 for the day. If I can get 20 people to be hanging out for 20 minutes after class, like that is such, that's what I want. I want a place where no one wants to leave. As they're walking off out the door, they're already getting like FOMO. They're like, I'm hmm. gonna miss out on something. Something's yeah. gonna happen. It's gonna be cool. Like, I just want that to be the vibe of the gym. And that was the vision. That was what I was trying to create. That was that was it. And that didn't, that hasn't left us. From we inside of that, we've gone from like trying to win the games. Yep to like uh, creating a family, to um, all the rest. But that's always been at the heart of what we're trying to create. If you have that, you know what you're trying to create. As opposed to like people ask like, do you charge extra for like open mm -hmm. gym? What about people that want to do extra accessory workout? Well, all those questions are like, once you know that, yeah. like that's ridiculous. What, what if people are like asking you questions outside of class? Do you set up a personal trip? It's like, it answers all those questions because you just want people to hang out. like. That's the goal. Like, can people come like um, early and do a whole bunch of stuff? What if they um, What if they want to take class and then do some competitor programming outside? Like, yes, all of it. Like, the goal is to have them there for as long as possible. It's interesting that. So before earlier, I asked, you know, when did you when did you flip the you know you're thinking between being a trainer and a, you know an entrepreneur and a business person? Probably, yeah. That was that was actually yeah. Probably because if you were just a well, trainer and you were no, I was still an entrepreneur then. I was I, I was running a business. Yep. So I, was, I just didn't know what I was trying to create. So maybe like truly like um, I went from a guy trying to make money on my own mm -hmm. to an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe an entrepreneur is truly a guy with a vision. It's not just a guy trying to make money. Right. You know, if I have a paper route. Right. You know, is that an entrepreneur? 
I don't know. Like <laughs> I, I, I'm my own boss. Yeah. If I don't go to work in the morning, like I don't get paid. Like it's my own business. But is that being an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And that's yeah. really cool. I think you know maybe we're defining something for right, ourselves right. here. But um, I think that that's really cool. It's like an entrepreneur maybe is somebody that um, has a vision of what they're trying to create in their own small business. Mm -hmm. I think we can leave it there. This is cool. a cool topic though. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. In the next episode of Chasing Excellence. To me, the biggest failure is achieving things that don't matter. Like, I don't want to be some chasing something that does not matter. Just search for Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. And thanks.